crying for inviting me. Uh, in the morning, I was wondering, where am I? I'm supposed to be talking on something, and I was hearing, you know, policy, diplomacy, strategic thinking. But then, in the last session, I think I have been brought nearer to the ground, though that was also a very uh, macro level. And, you know, biomass, I call it the stepchild of the renewable. Uh, uh, until this presentation, nobody talked the word biomass, even when we were talking of the renewable, including Dr. Kane's presentation. And yesterday I was attending a meeting in the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy and I was telling the same thing that when this orphan would be brought into the mainstream and for reasons, and that's what I would like to share with you uh, uh, for an entirely different reason because what we have been uh, talking so far had more of a macro perspective when, when you talk of biomass it is more of a going inward going to your you know, unserved, underserved population and when we talk of energy security, if we only talk in the context of the cities and keep these unserved and underserved, ever underserved, I don't think we'll have energy security. Uh, just an introduction, we are a, a consulting company in uh, alternate energy, which is efficiency and uh, primarily biomass, though we also work on hydro and solar nuclear. Uh, we have some uh, interesting projects which we have successfully commissioned uh, all over the world and we are very proud to uh, speak about, at least I speak about four of them. One I did in China, we did in China, I will share with you. Uh, we have engineered and commissioned the first 100% pedestal fire power project in India which has been successfully running. Uh, we have engineered the first successfully running waste energy project in India. So this is the waste energy. This is the second second question. You can combine both. No, I have my okay. First step in, no, I think that's the that's the big one you wrote like construct. Yeah, I know but uh, whatever oh, I said the first one the first one because the context is more that this is more of a technology. So engineer the largest single location biomass project, 105 megawatt in Sudan. Uh, this has been commissioned a few months back. Uh, when I talk of biomass projects, and this is the project I want to share with you in terms of energy access. Uh, this is a project we did in 2006 in northwest China, in an extreme poor rural area. This was an integrated project of gasification of locally available biomass which is blaze stock and grid connected power plant and 330 household in the adjoining villages supplied gas to a network and you see the slides the mid, mid slide is showing that you know the, the kitchen gas and uh, for me personally it was a very very uh, emotional you know, moment when those children came to hug when they had this you know the clean kitchen gas sort of liberation from smoky environment because of huge pile of coal in those areas and so when we talk of biomass uh, power uh, we, we talk of the energy access and in that project you know, it was a totally not only the technical part of it the participatory part of it the funds were raised participation from the Asian Development Bank, that's where we got mandated to do this project. The funds were provided by the local government and equal contribution was made by the local community. Every household member contributed and we had done the business model where the entire, you know, the, how the business would be run, how the community will operate it. So we trained the community and the entire plan still being operated by the community. So it was the technical model, it was the financial model, it was the institutional model and it was the business model. And I believe uh, for countries like India, it may not be so much that's a Thailand or but for countries like India, these kinds of models will have to be done to provide energy access. And when I was doing that project, I was, uh, uh, you know, we 
colleague, which I have seen in many parts of India, the women folks walk 7 to 8 kilometers to get the, their energy resource, which is the fuel and water. And there is a close nexus between them. <coughs> if we can make such clean energy access and available in the rural areas, it will not only give the energy, but it will also give this clean drinking water. Uh, right now, my parent company is running a water uh, plant in Bangladesh. So we have been asked to provide energy solution because that plant is running. Or the power is coming from diesel power, which is very expensive. So the water is very expensive. So we have been asked now to design a, uh, a local resource-based power plant, uh, which could be about 60 kilowatt or so for a similar kind of project. Uh, you see, uh, India, we have made some estimates what biomass power can do. And this slide talks about the diesel substitution for irrigation uh, pumps. And we have estimated that you know about 2.76 million tons per year of diesel can be substituted by making this energy available. And by further availability, another similar amount, about 3 million tons of uh, fuel oil is used for kerosene lamps and other things. So if you have this energy access, this kerosene lamps can also be substituted. And overall benefit, we have calculated that from the, just for the agro residues, this is not other biomass. About 63 million tons per year, per year can be easily harvested. And the total impact on the rural economy would be up to 150 thousand million per year, which would be more than any of the you know, social and poverty elevation schemes presently being run by the government in India. Uh, environment benefits, all we know that in addition to the what we call the GHG benefit, uh, in many parts of India, and so in Pakistan I have seen, the biomass is burnt in the field because the farmers want the field to be vacated for the next plantation and it is burned which is co which causes a lot of local pollution. So if we are able to develop this system, we will be not only doing the GHG emission reduction but also the local pollution uh, uh, reduction. And this is the overall benefit I was talking about. Uh, but despite all this attractiveness, from an immediate opportunity about 15,000 megawatt, we have just, we have been running 1500 megawatt and that is also running very poorly because of the low tariff, in fact yesterday you know, I was in the ministry just talking about that how we can uh, uh, salvage this situation because the regulators don't want to give fuel price escalation you know for, for fossil fuel based projects there is no hesitation in giving the fuel escalation but for biomass they will not give despite our pleading that if you give the biomass price to fuel escalation it is the rural economy which benefits if you give fuel subsidy for coal, you are subsidizing Indonesia. But if you are giving subsidy for biomass fuel, you are subsidizing the rural poor. But the regulators are still not understanding that. So we are struggling with it, but I believe that we should be able to you know, make it uh, uh, work. So the tariff, then the second part is the logistic. Because you know the biomass you have to harvest in two months and you have to provide the fuel for the whole year. So it has to be managed in terms of collecting quickly densifying, storage and all that system and then the biomass like straw and stocks they are very difficult uh, you know chemically so we have had to go through a lot of struggle in solving the technical issues but now they have been more or less tackled. Uh, the cost matrix uh, there are huge amount of cost elements when you go from the field to the storage to the plant and we have tried to convince the regulator despite all these cost metrics if you do the exact matrix for the fossil fuel the fossil fuel is at least one and a half times more expensive. Uh, so what needs to be done, say that the policy and regulatory, the regulatory policies are set right, the biomass projects can take off very well in India. Now coming to this global context, you know, that's something which makes me very happy. This is a, a, a picture which I use in many conventions and seminars I address, which is a forecast by the World Energy Council that in by about 1900, by 2050 or so, 2050, biomass will again become the, if you see when we started in the early 1900, the coal and biomass had the equal share of energy basket for the whole world. And then gradually biomass went down, coal is also going down, biomass went down very sharply. Coal will continue to go down, but biomass is taking a U-shaped curve. And it is forecasted that by 2050, 
of the total all the cell can be supplied from biomass. And that is also using only 20% of the biomass because there is a competitive use of biomass as fodder, as mulching, for thatching and all. Even if we get 20% of the biomass for the power in a country like Myanmar, it can be, it can be supporting 20% of the total. So our system. Thailand already has an ambitious target for biomass power and it can certainly meet it. Thailand, I have worked in sugar cogeneration long back and I think the sugar cogeneration is doing very well here and other biomass also is going to pick up very well. Uh, now, what are the levers? from our experience that the resource assessment has to be done very properly so that the pricing can be predicted and the regulators can be convinced that this is the price model which you can create. Uh, when we have done study in Europe, we have found that the predict tariff has been a very good lever for, we did some uh, study in Spain and France. We have studied in South Africa, that's where the utility model uh, we have worked in East Africa as I told you and currently we are working for some feasibility. In fact, it's going into the project state, which is in the Western Africa, which will be based on palm residues, which is otherwise extremely difficult. It's like 70 to 80 percent moisture. Nobody could ever think that palm residues can be used as a fuel. But I think we have found a solution. We have done some trial. We can dewater it using a sugar cane milling process. And, uh, 21 megawatt project is being planned in Ivory Coast for which we are doing a period event. Uh, conclusion that will, the biomass should be, has to be looked as an energy access for the extremely unserved and underserved areas and it has to be brought into the mainframe like solar and wind so that the regulators and policy makers, you know like as I was telling right from the morning, we never, we never heard the word biomass, we have heard everything else. Now, how do we bring it up? And to bring it up, it is the policy makers and the regulators who have to be playing a very prominent uh, role. I think we, we do have a good experience and we do believe that it should be possible to uh, make it happen. Well, let me go. Thank you. Let me go with my second presentation. Just, just one very small. Yeah. In the biomass, you are including the biofuel also. There are my jet tropa and other things. Uh, you see, there uh, jet tropa has not been a very successful experience in India because jet tropa, uh, you know, takes over the food lab, and so you will have a food versus fuel clash. What I am, uh, uh, what I have projected here is basically from the food crop. So the food crop, the residues of the food crop. Today, you know, we have done, I mean, in fact, I had time, I could have told you many research that you have done all over the world. 20 to 30 percent of the biomass gets degraded, wasted, and it generates methane, which is causing DNG pollution. And all I am saying is that cover efficiently collect that 20 percent and convert <coughs> that into energy for the conserved areas. And there are many models, let me tell you, right from 10 kilowatts. What we have done is right from 10 kilowatt, largest single model is 30 megawatt. So that's that's the spectrum. And there are many technologies, right? You have the gasification, the pyrolysis, the combustion. So you have many technologies which can they can be micro, mini, mega. Rice husk, you know, in the rice field, the rice husk. Husk is a very good fuel. I don't consider it an uh, I don't consider almost rice husk is now a better fuel than coal. I am talking about the straws and stocks which are not, which are very difficult to use. Rice husk is in, in India, it is a commercial fuel, in Thailand it is a commercial fuel right now. The waste to energy. Uh, um, in India, you know, the last 20 years, huge amount of efforts have been made to experiment to put up many waste energy plants and until a year back I don't think any project was successful in terms of power generation but we have uh, we commissioned a project in uh, February 2012 in Delhi which is a 16 megawatt project which has been successfully running uh, we are now engineering another project of 12 megawatt uh, and another waste to energy gasification 
project which is under commissioning in fact yesterday they told me it is running at 2 megawatt right now the first module has been commissioned and we are also doing a feasibility study on a biometrization biometrization based project for a smaller now, when you talk of waste energy technologies, the most important thing is the characterization of biomass. Uh, the biomass characteristics vary from country to country, from city to city, and <coughs> within the same city. For example, in cities like New Delhi, you will be surprised, you know, if you see this uh, chart I'm showing you. This is in the city of New Delhi. Uh, there are certain characteristics which are important for the energy conversion point of view they are varied by as much as 50 to 60 percent depending on the season, depending on the locality from where you are collecting the products. So that's, that becomes the biggest challenge when we talk about the biomass uh, energy conversion. Moisture, you see, is a scatter diagram. Uh, the samples collected from different uh, places at the same point of time. It's varying from 20 percent to as high as 80 percent. So if the biomass and the MSW is coming, from the municipal dump here, you never know what is coming. Is it 80 percent moisture? Is it 20 percent moisture? It's, it's not in your control. So, so the technology when you talk of, once you know the characteristics of biomass, then you have to think of the technology, which will be first level is that how do you homogenize this biomass to become a consistent fuel, and then second, how do you convert it? And for each of these, if you see the biomethanation technology or a pyrolysis specification or an RDF or an incineration, there are certain compatible characteristics and there are certain things which are very harmful. Uh, for example, in biomethanation, uh, non-paper fiber is extremely bad. If you put plastics in a biomethanation plant, it will ruin the plant. But in a uh, uh, RDF or a pyrolysis, it's no problem. Biomethanation should be very good when you have kitchen waste, food waste and things like that. Uh, uh, in all the projects, except for incineration to some extent, it is very therefore, it's very important to prepare the biomass. And it can be a very elementary manual process to a very highly sophisticated automated process. Uh, the one of the projects which has been set up in uh, Delhi, I mean in Pune, right now, which I told you, the 2 megawatt yesterday I was told, it's running. It is a very highly sophisticated automated handling system by which the separation, segregation, you are removing the harmful subjects and you prepare that biomass which can be uh, aggressive. So the processes are received handling, then you sort of uh, shred it. Remove the inerts because in our countries also, you know, the road sweepings, the building debris is all going to the uh, garbage. And they are very harmful for uh, most of the things. Metals, if you go for biomethanation, if there are metals, they will poison the, I mean, they will kill the uh, uh, process. So you have then the object, you have the dryer, and then you have got the finished RDF, which can be sold as a fuel or this can be used for subsequent uh, energy generation in the project. In India now, many of the, uh, many of the places, they are doing only up to RDF, and this RDF is being used by cement mill, is putting into the kiln, and that's a very good way of handling this use of some uh, Biometrization technology, you have this uh, first the fuel preparation, and then you have the slurry preparation, you have the digestion, then the gas generation, and then the gas engine based system. Uh, the best plant, uh, when we were doing the feasibility studies, uh, we visited a large number of plants in India and abroad. And the best plant we have seen is in Tel Aviv. It's a beautifully running plant, almost totally automated. And you, you, you can see that whether it's a waste based plant or a golf course, it's a beautifully uh, uh, run project. But it's expensive. Uh, it, Jamshedpur authorities, they were thinking of putting it up, but then it is too expensive, they have not decided yet. Uh, this is a project which has been successfully running in Delhi, which is a 16 megawatt project, where all we do is homogenization of the biomass. So, what we have done is we have created a huge storage, about 7 days worth of biomass can be stored, and the grab crane. So when the waste is being received, the grab crane is handling it and homogenizing <coughs> it. And so the moisture gets 
spray and from the top you are bidding to the incinerator and this plant is running very well. Uh, this is a new technology which I was talking to you about uh, in the Pune uh, which is based on a very very innovative technology. It is uh, it's a two stage conversion. First we do a pyrolysis and then do a reformation and produce the same gas and then do the gas cleanup, the same gas and the same gas goes to the engine generator. Now this system is almost twice as efficient compared to all other systems you have talked about. So for the same amount of waste in this technology we will be able to produce about 1.7 times more power but it has got huge technical challenges. Uh, we, we did a, uh, a full scale pilot study by establishing the heat and mass balance in fact, the vendors wanted a certificate from us, so we studied, get them the whole balance, and this is that certificate based on which the project was financed. Uh, now, this project has uh, come up. This shows, you know, the flare tower. Uh, when the first commissioning was done, only the gasification island, the engine systems have been put later. Uh, so, a uh, few more technologies which are coming up is one is that. Uh, high temperature biolysis where the question you raised it may be possible to produce even biofuel from MSW uh, in Spain uh, people are doing a lot of research on this technology and other system which is very interesting is a micro digesters where every household can treat the biomass or the kitchen waste and get the gas for supplying the kitchen in fact uh, a uh, few such modules, one of the experimental module is uh, running in our Ministry of Energy, which is a, you know, like a, a homemade system. Uh, so our learning is for the different technologies. Uh, each one has its own merit. And all these technologies would have to be used because, you know, if you are a small city, just about 200 TPD biomass generation, you will have to have certain technology versus in a city like Delhi where you have 5,000 tons per day generation. So an array of technology can be used and the emerging technologies can be simultaneously encouraged to develop. And I do believe that it's, it's not an energy security, but it is cleaning up the cities and in the process you are getting some energy out of it. Thank you very much.